Hi everyone, welcome. I'm just going to give everybody one last minute to catch up and join live. There are already quite a few of you here and um, I appreciate that. This is another home edition, number 104 of the series. And I, I feel a little bit rusty. In fact, I hope everything's working okay and you can see me and hear me and whatnot. Uh, because uh, it seems like the last few, we yes, last few weeks uh, the universe has conspired in some way or another to just get in my way and not allow me to do a live stream. And in fact, this week is no different because uh, this morning at the very last minute, we had a change of plans with our uh, child care situation. So I'm actually alone in the house right now with my two-year-old who is um, watching a movie with her headphones on the other side of the camera. And uh, I don't know if this is going to work or not. I'm essentially, I'm babysitting. Although if it's your own kid, I don't know if you can call it babysitting. But um, so yeah, this is, feels a little bit weird and a little bit, you know, a two-year-old, if any of you have raised children, you know it's basically a ticking time bomb. And uh, so we'll see if we can pull this off. But uh, I do want to jump right into this episode because uh, I maybe foolishly chose 10 objects, 10 rare finds in the, the Musée de Montmartre, the Montmartre Museum. And I was thinking, even if I spend five minutes on each of those 10 objects, um, this is obviously going to be about an hour, which is, which is long. And I, am, I tend to be a bit verbose, so uh, I'm going to try to keep it concise for each object. And so we can get through all 10 of them without being here all day. I'm just going to check in with my comments here. A lot of folks who are happy to be back. I'm happy to, to have you as well. Heather Jackson says, it's, it's not babysitting. It's just being a working dad. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. So welcome, everybody, again. Let's jump right into this episode 104. In Montmartre, I know many of you know it and love it, the 18th arrondissement. There's a place, the, the, the Museum of the History of Montmartre is a very charming place for a number of reasons and pretty fascinating as well. And... Um, it's a place that a lot of people don't get to, and I, I actually understand why they don't, because I, I recommend it all the time to tourists and people who are on my tours and whatnot. Uh, but if you've got maybe just a day or even two days in Montmartre, I really think your time is best spent walking around. Uh, it's such a great neighborhood for that, that you absolutely should do that. And so I think, um, understandably so, a lot of people don't consider like, oh, I, wanna, I don't want to take two hours out of my time and, and go into a a museum but uh, if you do go inside uh, it's really quite wonderful you can look back I, I should have checked what number episode it was but I did another episode uh, in the past about the studio of artist Suzanne Valadon and you should definitely check that out um, someone can put in the comments perhaps what what number that is or I'll put a link somewhere um, and so there are a lot of big big things that you can see but today again I'm calling them the rare finds of the the Musée de Montmartre and maybe things that you might pass by without necessarily realizing their significance or things that are just hidden gems, uh, even though I hate that term, it's so overused, but there are hidden gems. And um, yeah, everyone says, yep, your parenting, Corey. I'm just looking at the comments here, by the way. Uh, Lisa says, yes, that studio and the apartment were amazing. So check out that episode, Suzanne Valadon. And you can see a recreation of the artist's studio, which is really lovely. So we did a deep dive into that on a previous episode. So uh, what else do I want to say? Oh yeah, well thanks to everybody who's watching me live right now. Uh, if you are watching live at this moment, remember you can support the channel in a couple of ways and this project in general. Uh, you can do the, the super chat donations if you're watching live and that's always appreciated. I'll give you a little shout out if I see something. And uh, there's Patreon as well, whether you're live or not. Uh, you can hit the link and I think uh, my PayPal should be in the description as well if you want to contact me through that. And I think that's it. That's it. Let's jump into this episode, because like I said, we've got a lot of good stuff to, to go. So let me pull up a slideshow here. Uh, this is the Musée de Montmartre, if you don't know, if you haven't been. It's uh, a few gardens that are attached to each other. This is actually from within uh, one of the gardens, looking out toward in the middle ground. You've got a water reservoir from the days where they needed to gravity feed water to the hill. It was very hard to pump it up the hill of Montmartre. And then behind that, you've got the bell tower of the Sacré-Cœur. We're actually going to talk about the Sacré-Cœur today uh, because there's a, a really lovely, subtle, but magical uh, document tucked away in this Musée de Montmartre, in the Montmartre Museum. I'm so glad to see everybody, all the live viewers here in the chat saying hello to each other because even though it's been a while since you've seen me, I know it's been a while since you all have been able to interact as well. David Dubois is asking me, Corey, did we pass the museum during our Montmartre tour last year? Um, yeah, my visit, my, my, my guided tour that I do, my walking tour of this area, goes very close to it. This is on the, a street called the Rue Corteau, spelled C-O-R-T-O-T. -T. And uh, so we w walk very, very close to it, close enough that um, I often point it out to people and I say, just up the street there, check out the museum if you can. 
So this is a photo that I took a couple years ago. This is another photo of here where you can see the uh, the studio in the, midi in the middle and then on the right hand side the former studio of Renoir. Um, and this is called the Café Renoir. In fact, this is the first object that I want to talk about, the first rare find, because this café is an absolute dynamite quiet spot. And just look at these beautiful, uh, this vista that you've got through the glass. And I just love that it's called the Café Renoir, the fact that you can sit in this café and, and literally contemplate the fact that he would have painted throughout these, this, these gardens in the 19th century. And again, he had a studio here on this site. So that is a lovely place. The Café Renoir is um, our number one rare find. Now you can, you have to pay to get into the museum, although you can spend just five euros and get access to the gardens. So you can't go and check out the collections inside the buildings themselves. But I absolutely, even I tell people, if you don't have time to do the full museum, spend the five euros to get access to all the garden spaces, uh, which are fairly vast, you know, and uh, you can get access to the to the cafe. So yeah, it's sort of you're paying an extra premium, that extra five euros um, on top of whatever beverage you buy. But you can get coffee here, you can get wine. Uh, the staff seem always, always just uh, dynamite and really, really lovely. I don't. I, someone's hiring well, put it that way. And uh, so please do that. It's a really if you come there, if you avoid lunchtime, because you can get lunch there. You can get light lunches of. Uh, salads and sandwiches, but if you want to uh, have a really lovely, quiet, private, so to speak, uh, coffee, contemplating Renoir and the Impressionists and just the, the vibe of Montmartre, the tourists don't come in through here too often because you have to pay. So um, please, please do that for sure. So let's move on. Ah, Pam Pamela Hosey says, bonjour, tu m'as manqué. I've missed you. Thank you. Hi, Laura Poffenberger wants to do a freak meet in this cafe. Yes, that would be a lovely, lovely thing. So let's pause here because uh, number two of the, the rare finds that you want to find uh, or you want to search out in this museum is this is an actual uh, bar, a real uh, pewter topped bar, tin top bar. Uh, it came from a bistro on a street. It was transplanted here from a street that many of you know and, and love. It's called the Rue de la Brevoire. And this is uh, pretty much the best street in the world, if I do say so myself. And this is a, f a photo that I was lucky enough to take a couple of years ago. And it was on this very street that in the late 1800s, turn of the century, there was a bistro uh, with this bar. And the bar was uh, saved during the Nazi occupation because the occupying Nazis and the, uh, the Vichy government, the French government, that were collaborating with the Nazi forces, they were melting down every piece of metal they could find, uh, including a lot of statues, bronze statues and whatnot. So this bar was protected by its owners in that bistro by um, hiding it behind a fake wall. And you can see that beautiful tin. And look on the left how they have a separate holders for all the wine bottles. And that thing on the right, some sort of fountain that you would fill from the top, either wine or water. I think those are just fantastic. So this was, they built a fake wall to hide the entire bar and it was spared. Uh, from being melted down for Nazi weaponry and it is just chilling out in a little room, essentially a room that they, they built almost as a recreation of a turn of the century bistro because as you'll see here, um, this is kind of funny. They've got hanging on the wall next to the bar this thing called the thermometer of a, of a drunkard, of a drunk. And you can see there are actually different stages. There are six stages of getting drunk. And you can see at the top, of course, you know, everything's fine. You're a functioning member of society. And then as you go from from one stage to the next, things get a little bit, you know, and they, there are descriptions and uh, here it's, it's kind of fun because the, um, you can see about halfway down, first of all, right here, third degree, according to this thermometer, so to speak, is you're, you're just, you're loving life, you're, you're, you're good to go. And in fact, right here, they, they have some uh, sort of colloquialisms or nicknames of what you would call someone, at least in the turn of the century. And this says lancé or parti, which means you're kind of off to the races. You're gone, you're, you've taken off, you know. And, um, and then right here you can see, but by the time you get to the fourth degree, in fact, if you look carefully, um, you could split the artist. Basically, he could split uh, left and right. And on the left-hand side, he put a smiling face. And on the right-hand side, he put a, uh, a frowning face. So by the time you get to the fourth degree, you're you're pretty wrecked. And then the fifth degree out of six is you're obviously 
not doing too well at all. And again, I love, I love this over here. It says, um, you would be considered or called the dans les vignes, which means in the vineyard or, or among the vines. So I don't know if that was very common to say that back then. And I don't even know if the French still say it now, but if you are pretty much, you know, uh, plastered and on your way to sleeping on the floor, uh, they would at least back then call you, they would say that you're dans les vignes, you're, you're actually in, in the vines, in the vineyard. Shea Davis says, love this. <laughs> Natalie Hayes says, which degree are you at, Corey? Uh, I've been a good boy today, so I'm at, I'm at zero, sadly. I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I don't know. I always feel a little bit, a little bit um, guilty. Something about Paris just goes, goes with wine, goes with alcohol. Feels wrong to do it sober. Um, so what we've also got here, as I said, this is a, essentially a recreation of a, of a little bistro. So in addition to this hanging on the wall, we've got a lovely piano that would have been in a, in a cabaret or a bistro. And, you know, God knows who might have played on that. And uh, this beautiful painting by an artist by the name of uh, Villette. And Villette did a lot of uh, decorations for the Chanois Cabaret and the Moulin Rouge, etc. And um, speaking of the cabaret, the Chat Noir, I know a lot of you have heard of it the Black Cat Cabaret, which was pr pretty much the, pl the place to be in Montmartre in the late 1800s, 1890s. Uh, one reason the Chat Noir Cabaret got so huge is that they were known for doing these um, shadow puppet theater productions. And there was a troupe of people who had perfected this art. They, were, they called themselves the Théâtre d'Ombre, or the, the, the Theater of Shadows. And they would do this in the cabaret, cabaret, cabaret of the Chat Noir, and they would set up these are made of metal and um, they act as stationary backdrops, but then the, the puppeteers would come with other pieces of metal as puppets, as shadow puppets, and they would interact in these very uh, elaborate scenes. And they were all the rage. People actually, they just adored them. And what would happen is, um, let's say, for example, you've got this one. You'd be projecting light through and all the men would be crouched, sort of like, you know, like they would do, like Jim Henson would do with the Muppets, right? And then they would have, they'd be holding sticks with other people or other characters, right? That would pop up here and they would, they would interact and they would move around uh, among the scenes. So it actually created a very elaborate, very sophisticated type of performance. And there was music and there, were, there was humor, etc. And so the Chat Noir became um, known for many things, but these... The Shadow Puppet Theater was really one thing that drew the huge crowds. And what's lovely is we're going to do some zooms in here. And I think this is, again, one of the great uh, hidden treasures of the Musée de Montmartre is that you can, you can almost reach out and touch these iconic objects from, from the, the good old days of the cabaret, the Parisian cabaret. I should mention that some of these things I'm showing you are part of the permanent collection and would be there, uh, for example, tomorrow if you, if you visited. Uh, and then some of these things I'm going to show have been temporary exhibits, which I'll try to point out as we go. So here you can see uh, what I mentioned. We got the handle on the bottom. I, I apologize for this crappy photo. When I took it, I was never thinking I would use it as a, a video presentation. But it gives you an idea of the, how they would... Um, have these characters interact with the scenery. And speaking of the Chat Noir, there we go, because in the museum as well, which and this draws a crowd uh, most days, is one of the original lithographs of this iconic image. By the way, side note, this image is so iconic that in my software, when I was putting together this slideshow, I tried to save this. I tried to save a copy of this image and the uh, Adobe program wouldn't let me do it. I think that they, uh, there was something blocked, like a copyright that was blocking my use of copying it. And I hope that, I hope YouTube doesn't pull it down for that reason. I think I'm, I should be okay. But I just thought that that was a kind of proof that this is such an iconic image that even, even your computer knows when you're using it. Uh, and of course the Black Cat Cabaret, this is no longer around anymore, sadly, but it was one of the great cabarets of all time, not just Paris, but the entire world. And then um, I'm showing you that because what was, what was kind of cute and, and made me chuckle is when I was in the gardens of this very museum one day, I saw a black cat. 
saw my own Chat Noir right outside the, the exhibit. Lois High says, yeah, visiting the museum tomorrow. Oh, how we wish. I was thinking the same thing, Lois, as I was saying that in the back of my mind. I was thinking, ah, ain't nobody visiting it tomorrow. It's so great to have you all here live. I'm uh, just great turnout. I really appreciate the support. Okay, so on to our fifth rare find of the Montmartre Museum. And this is what I mentioned earlier about this is old yellow faded document from 1915. This is actually number four, the object um, that I want to show you. And what it is, it shows, it shows all the strata of bedrock underneath, within the hill or the butte of Montmartre. And I'm gonna, I, I, I know many of you have, have walked up the stairs to the, the Basilica of the Sacré-Cœur, which is what we see here, but a lot of people don't realize the structure underneath in order to build this damn thing. Because what you're looking at here are pillars that are, there are 83 stone pillars that they had to bore down into the ground just to support this immense building. And each of those 83 pillars is 140 feet tall. Uh, for you metric folks, that's 43 meters. You can see it written on the right-hand side here. 43 meters or 140 feet each of these, and there are 83 of them. So it was an immense undertaking even before they built the actual basilica. Uh, and why did they have to do that? Well, because the ground was unstable as it, as it was. You can see all those various layers shifting and whatnot, but they had so many um, uh, stone quarries. They, were, they had been mining stone, uh, gypsum in particular, and limestone, and it was like a Swiss cheese of tunnels underneath this thing. And so when they decided to build this uh, huge uh, structure, they knew that it would never, never uh, survive. It would just be engulfed by a sinkhole almost immediately. So uh, to give you an idea, let me get rid of this. Uh, 140 feet, and I, re I, I, I researched this so I could give you a sort of a visual. That is like if you were to put two Louvre pyramids on top of each other. That gives you an idea of how, how far into the earth the foundations have to descend just to simply keep this uh, up. And this was actually something that was done with many of the Gothic cathedrals as well. They had to build very, very deep um, just to keep that, just to keep these things upright. Hopefully some of you will find that interesting. And to give you another visual reference, if you're ever visiting the Sacré-Cœur, this is a photo I took in 2019, uh, the height of the pillars underneath are essentially the same height as this front facade. So if you're, if you're standing in front of the building, you can look at the height of this facade and imagine essentially the same height going, descending down into the hill itself. So I hope that makes sense. I think that's pretty fascinating, pretty fun. Thank you, Emily, for that in the super chats. I can see that, I appreciate the support. Isn't that fascinating? So all of that from this one little faded uh, document from 1915. And uh, like I said, you could be in the museum and distracted by other uh, marquee items and, and not even uh, take the time to realize what they're, what they're saying, what they're telling us, but it's pretty. Yesenia says that's impressive. And Lori says an amazing feat for the time it was built. It's so great to see all of these familiar names. I really appreciate it. On to number five. This is the number five. So this one, I want, I'm curious how many of you recognize this right off the bat. If you've taken my walking tour of Montmartre before in person, then I, uh, you heard me talk about it. This is really fun because I, for those of you who don't know the story, I'll give you the really, really quick overview. In the famous cabaret in Montmartre called the Lapin Agile, au Lapin Agile, the owner had a donkey. The donkey's name was Lolo. One day, a group of customers, including uh, the artist and art critic, uh, his name was Roland d'Orgelès, D'Orgelès got his friends together and they said, we're going to play a prank on the art world and we're going to take Lolo the donkey, who was always hanging out at the cabaret. We're going to tie a paintbrush to his tail and back him up to a canvas and have this donkey paint a picture. We're going to sign it with a human name and submit it to the art exhibit of Paris that year, this is 1910, and see if people will fall for it and see if we can trick the critics into falling in love with a donkey painting. And then, of course, we'll tell them what happened because it was a secret. And then we'll, they'll all have egg on their face and they'll look stupid. And so that's what this is. Now, this is not part of the permanent collection. So I had, tell, I had told this story to my, to my clients uh, for years and years and years. And I showed them this image on my iPad and whatnot. And then I heard that 
the temp exhibit was coming through with the actual painting and I could see it for myself. So this was a, an absolute treat. And so this is the, the famous painting of Lolo the donkey and um, his tail marks. So the end of that story is right here. In 19, this is 1910 on, on April 1st, April Fools, because they do celebrate that to some extent in Paris as well in France. Um, the people behind the prank published this article. And um, with the, you can see the donkey there with doing his thing, and they, he's got his paints and his palette and whatnot on the ground. And what this text says essentially is um, saying, hey, this, uh, this painting was a, a big hit, or at least uh, uh, sparked a lot of conversation, and people were curious about this new unknown artist. And it turns out it was Lolo the donkey up in Montmartre, and we just did this because uh, we think the critics are full of it, and they don't know what good art is, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of their manifesto published in uh, a publication at the time that was called the Fantasia, if I'm not mistaken. Now, this is, it gets even more interesting because what they did with, also with, they published this photo that we're gonna see next. And this is also something I've shared with my clients on my walking tours. And this was to show everybody how stupid they had been and being like, um, oh, you like that painting uh, in the exhibit? Well, guess, guess who did it? And they did this with, they've got the masks and they're all toasting to Lolo the donkey. And you can see on the left that he's, Lolo has a paintbrush tied to his tail and he's in the act of creation. However, I have to admit that even as I was showing this to my clients, I didn't realize that it had been doctored. You can kind of tell if you look carefully in the lower half, like where the paintbrush is and certainly the paint cans on the lower right. And what really drove this home is when I was at this, this exhibit and I saw the painting, what they also had next to it was the original painting. And you can see, in fact, or the original photo, sorry. They, in fact, did not have masks at all. And let me put these side by side because this was quite a fun revelation. So on the left, you have the original photo that was taken. And then on the right, the photo that they decided to publish when, they, when the jig was up and they decided to um, reveal the prank. So you can see this is 1910 and um, photoshopping uh, quote unquote, was already alive and well. You can see that took that original photo on the left and on the right they doctored it. And so they went in and they added, I assume by hand somehow they did a, uh, a pastiche of various things and they decided to put in the tail and the paintbrush and the canvas and then those paint cans on the lower right are all fake and added, and of course the masks. They went in and they, they drew in the masks. Um, so I don't know, you can make of that what you will but I think that, that was pretty interesting. And again, even someone like me who's in love with history and I've told this story specifically hundreds of times, I never knew that until I saw the original photo and I said, well, I'll be, I'll be darned. That is a doctored photo. And even a hundred years ago, they were doctoring photos for their own artistic uh, expression. Thanks, David Dubois, in the, in the comments. I can see your support there. I really appreciate that. So on to our sixth little gem, this, these are the photos of the dancers of the Can Can, um, specifically at the Moulin Rouge and the other great cabarets. And there's some really charming, again, these are, these are photos that I snapped not knowing that I, I was gonna use them for anything later on. So I apologize, there's some glare and stuff, but I've done my best to, to spruce them up enough so that we can enjoy them today. So I'm gonna go through a, a series of, of these Can Can dancers from the late uh, 1800s, from the Belle Epoque, you know, good old, good old fashioned cabaret days. This first lady here is a very famous woman called La Goulue, a very famous dancer. And La Goulue, she started um, down in Montparnasse and the, um, the cabarets and the bars, including the Closerie des Lilas. If you're a Hemingway fan, you know that, that bar, the Closerie des Lilas. She um, started out there and she became a big performer at the Moulin Rouge. She was popular for her charm and her audacious performances and she would do a high kick that was so high she would use her toe to kick off the hats of gentlemen that were standing next to her, you know, in the, in the Moulin Rouge. And here you can see her, she's looking quite sassy. Here she's in a picnic uh, setting photo shoot, chomping on some chicken, which I guess that was um, one way to get the, get the boys all hot and bothered. Now La Goulou, her, her stage name, that was a nickname because Goulou is French for glutton. And uh, she was called the glutton because she was known for when she was doing her dance, her cabaret, she would go by the tables of customers and she would just grab the half um, drunken um, glasses of, of alcohol from the customers themselves and just down them. So she'd go through and just be drinking everybody's uh, glasses. And so she got, she was nicknamed the glutton or la goulue. And she was one of the big stars of the Moulin Rouge for sure. She was even featured in several paintings and posters of Toulouse-Lautrec. So she was one of the, one of the big stars, if not the star. Now, one of her teachers 
and mentors was another can can dancer known as uh, Gris des Goûts. And these are the two of them. So we've got La Goulou. <laughs> this is such a funny pose where they're holding up each other's legs. We've got the, um, La Goulou on the left and her teacher slash mentor, uh, Gris des Goûts. Now, Gris des Goûts is another nickname or another stage name. It actually means sewer grate. And that is because this uh, lady had a big gap between her teeth. And so I don't know if she came up with it or someone else did. I don't know if it was derogatory or just in jest, but she became known as the sewer grate or the gris des goûts. And I've got some more images here. Again, these are all a part of the collection of the museum. And so I've got some more of the gris, of Madame gris des goûts here with, you know, I'm sure we all enjoy a beverage like this from time to time. If you have enough glasses of wine, maybe you could try this out, I don't know. So this is, uh, again, the same gris des goûts, and this is her as well. You can see it written on there. Really charming poses, pretty hilarious stuff. And this is a woman uh, by the name of, she was called La Torpille or the Torpedo. And my goodness, this poor girl for this shoot, what is she, first of all, what is she on? Some kind of slab of, of stone or granite, and she's got to do a split. And I don't know what this, what this pose is. And look at this corset, oh, this poor girl, look at how tight that corset is squeezing in on her organs. Daniel Molden says, oh my, weird names. And she says, the glutton, not a very complimentary name. Yeah, I wonder, Daniel, what the, what the actual, I'd like to go back in time and see what the actual uh, dynamic was like. I know that these girls got a lot, quite a bit of fame and in often, case, quite a, in often cases quite a lot of money and became, I've even seen um, some of them labeled as having been rich and famous for at least a period of their careers. But again, I guess we don't know exactly what, what was playing out there. Uh, next up, I just, this is a really quick one, number seven, is every now and then in the uh, museum's gift shop, which uh, always has a few interesting items, you can buy occasionally, depending on the time of year, that famous uh, wine of Montmartre. Some would call it the infamous wine of Montmartre because uh, it's commonly known to not be very good, although it gets better each year. And this is the wine from the vineyard of Montmartre. I'll show you a, uh, an image in a minute. But I don't know if you can make it out on your screen, but in the lower left there, that price tag does say 50 euros at the gift shop, 50 euros per bottle. And as you can make out here, this not, it's not even a full size wine bottle, but it supports a good cause. Uh, the proceeds from this very unique wine comes uh, or is given to the elderly and the children of the 18th arrondissement. So your money is going toward uh, a good cause and, but it is, it is pricey. Some people buy this and they don't even drink it. It's just a keepsake, something fun for the wine cellar. And it famously comes each year the vintage comes from this vineyard known as the Clos Montmartre, which is just attached to the museum itself. This is looking uh, from the museum over the, the vineyard. So that's another rare find that um, it, it's not a guarantee, but occasionally if you, if you pop through the gift shop, keep an eye out for that Montmartre wine. Now, the reason it's so rare is that wine is really only, only drinkable or only findable, viable, if that's a word, um, during the wine festival in October that they hold in Montmartre. And this gift shop is literally the only place, only other place that I've seen that you can purchase this wine. Other than that, you won't find it in bars. You usually won't find it in any bistros in the area. Uh, so I thought that was interesting to note. Thanks, Karen McCusker. I see you there in, in the live comments. I appreciate your support. It's great to have you here. And onward. This is fun. We got some. I came across a temporary exhibit of some movie memorabilia, and uh, here we've got. As you maybe see Woody Allen. We got some memorabilia from Midnight in Paris, and so this was the clapper board that was used, and you can see that on the on the lower portion there on the green tape, it was the 12th of August in 2010 when they were filming on this particular day. So a lot of the filming happened in 2010, July and August, and. That makes sense that they would come and film in August because, as many of you know, the locals go away on holiday, on vacation. And so really it's the quietest that you'll see Paris as far as trying to film on the streets. So what's also interesting is I realized just as I was preparing this slideshow that August of 2010 was my very first summer in Paris, living in, in France. So I moved here in March of 2010 and little did I know that very first summer as I was 
exploring the city and, and trying to get used to my new home, who would have thought that maybe a few, couple of streets over, uh, the whole Midnight in Paris was being filmed without me even knowing about it. Thanks, Lisa Choney. I can see you there in the comments. She says, here's to parenting and live touring without skipping a beat. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that, Lisa. If I make it look easy, it's, it's, all, it's all a facade, I can tell you. It's, it's all an act. And then you can see on the right-hand side of this, of this image that there is a script. And so we're going to have some fun uh, and just quickly look at some of the, the script pages that they had on exhibit as well. Now, the name across here, Anne Siebel or Anne Seibel, she was the main art director for Midnight in Paris. And she actually was nominated for an Oscar in the category of Best Art Direction. Um, so this, this movie took Woody Allen to a whole new level. Yeah. Oh, you have a problem? Okay, let me go check check out the problem. Let me help you, sweetie. Here you go. Yeah, this doesn't work. Okay, I think it's working now. Okay. Sorry, folks. That was bound to happen. Thanks, Laura Mirlez. I appreciate that in, this, in the, the comments. Appreciate the support. So, yeah, back to Anne Siebel, who... Uh, was nominated for an Oscar for Best Art Direction, and this was her script, obviously. If we zoom in a little bit at the top, this is page one of the script, and you'll see it says right at the top, montage, point of view shots of Paris set to music. And of course, if you're like me and you're a lover of Midnight in Paris, you know very much what that's all about. I don't know if they had planned, in fact, you, you can say, you can see here, uh, we hear voiceovers of Gil and, I, and Inez, a young couple of uh, Americans engaged to be married as we shall learn and then it says standard locations are listed here But they will be determined later when we location scout so they didn't actually know what they were going to film They just got there on the street and decided what what looked good and then the text here You can see VO meaning voiceover um, a lot of this stuff you don't actually hear so they tweaked the the dialogue a little bit and I, I can I contemplated doing a <laughs> doing an Owen Wilson impression here, but I, I I've decided against it. I don't think that would be good for anybody. But you can see that that's he does say where the, there's no city like this that it never was. He does say that actually in in the film. The next page is at the end of the movie. You can see interior of the Moulin Rouge when uh, Owen Wilson and Marion Cotillard, Adriana are at the Moulin Rouge, so they've gone back in time again, and they're at the Moulin Rouge, the Belle Époque, and they're about to meet Toulouse-Lautrec and Gauguin and Degas. And uh, I thought we would have some fun with this one because I've queued up the audio of, of this, and we can, I thought it might be fun for us to follow along and just see what, what is um, faithful to the text and what changed. So we're going to start right around here. This is where we're... Adriana says, look, look, I see Toulouse-Lautrec. And we're just going to follow through a little bit of the audio. I hope you'll enjoy this. We'll get to cue this up here. Oh, my God. Pablo admires him so much. I have to say hello. Come well, no, no, maybe we shouldn't Come bother him. I'm nervous. Really? Okay. But we know he's a lonely man. Yeah. I'm sure he would love some company. Okay, okay, let's go. Monsieur Lautrec. Oui. Bonsoir. Nous sommes de grands admirateurs. Merci, madame. Pouvons-nous vous offrir un verre Ah ben, j'en je serai enchanté. Vous prenez un siège He's asking us to sit down with him. This much French, I do understand in the gesture. Vous êtes américain Yes, I'm an American. Je l'ai deviné à votre accent. Yeah, yeah oui, oui. Vos dessins, votre peinture, nous admirons tout ce que vous faites. I, I love your drawings. Bonsoir. Merci. Ça va ah, bon, j'adore. Ça aurait du mal de vous présenter, monsieur Gauguin et monsieur Degas. Bonsoir. Enchanté. Bonsoir, enchanté. enchanté. Paul Gauguin. Bonsoir. Yes, yes, yes. You see the sketch he's made? Nobody can draw like this today. Not Picasso, not Matisse. Oh, it's unbelievable. Parlez-vous anglaise? Non, monsieur. Il parle un petit peu. Non, non, I speak, ouais, je parle très bien. Oui. Bon. Bah oui, tu vas voir. Uh, Degas and I were just talking about how this, uh, um, this cette, cette génération est dépourvue de sens et, et manque d'imagination. He said, he says that this generation is empty and has no imagination. Mm. Better to have lived. Your... Well, you can see, uh, it's just kind of fun. I like to follow along like that with uh, a script. Uh, thanks, thanks, Liz, for the super chat, and thank you to Jean Pomeroy. Appreciate that, everybody. What we also found is, uh, or what I found during this exhibit, is some mood board 
Uh, this is from Midnight in Paris as well, and what they were trying to do is decide how we're going to set design for the Moulin Rouge for this scene that we just listened to. So you can see they were putting together bits of fabric and light fixtures and furniture, costuming and whatnot. And then also, um, same thing, same part of the film. On the right-hand side, top and bottom, you can see they were trying to uh, do sketches of what the red light district, district would look like when uh, these two characters are walking through and you can see the, the women uh, on the street there. We also had, uh, during the same exhibit, uh, Amelie uh, memorabilia. And so this is on the set of Amelie. And these are Polaroids taken during that time. Probably for, um, you know, for wardrobe and makeup and hair and whatnot. And look at those uh, on the bottom part there of um, Audrey Totu. She was such, just so adorable. What a, a sweetheart and what a cutie. Perfect for that movie. And if you, if you know this movie, there's a mystery revolving around um, a photo booth and torn up photos that Amelie is trying to figure out. And so these were some of the original props. And then this, of course, the Polaroids of the gnome. I guess if you haven't seen this movie, Amelie, then you have no idea why this is interesting. But these are the actual props used of the traveling gnome in the movie. Really fun. So that was a, a thrill for me to see this. This is, uh, these are animals that are hanging in, on the, I believe on the walls of the apartment in the Amelie movie, in her apartment, and they start talking, they start to animate, and they're talking to each other and whatnot. So those are the actual paintings hanging in the museum that I got to see. And then um, this here, again, if you remember the movie, her elderly neighbor is trying to paint and repaint and capture the magic of this famous Renoir painting. It's called The Luncheon of the Boating Party by Renoir. And so I don't know if this was one of the props actually used or if it was just, just a conceptual thing to get the to, to get the idea for the movie, you know, as a preliminary sketch. But anyway, this references the fact that the character in the movie, her neighbor, is trying to uh, paint and repaint this Renoir painting. So all that was really, really fun. And then the last bit of memorabilia from Amelie is a uh, some storyboards from a scene where they are running through Montmartre, and you can see the Moulin Rouge on the left and whatnot. So that was fun. Again, I guess you, will have, you would have, have to have seen the movie to give a damn about this, but hopefully some of you out there will find that to be interesting. Okay, onward. We're coming up on number nine. We've got two, two more rare finds to talk about here. This one, uh, if you're like me, you have no idea upon first look of what the heck this thing is. And it turns out if you start digging into it, it's a, a pretty fascinating little bit of Parisian history. There used to be street vendors, especially in the 1800s, uh, the streets were full of various vendors that were mobile and they would strap various things on their back or carry things around so that they could go to where the pedestrians were and the clientele and they could sell their wares. Uh, this was a, uh, an apparatus uh, of a fountain where you would serve beverages out of. And it was the, the, the beverage was called Coco, C-O-C-O. But it wasn't hot chocolate. It wasn't even a coconut beverage. It was taking a cold, refreshing lemon-flavored water and macerating um, licorice into it. So it was a kind of a, a licorice-flavored lemonade. And it was cold and it was refreshing. So on a hot summer day, these gentlemen would strap this on and they would go around and, um, and sell it to the families in the parks and on the Grand Boulevard de Paris and, 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 and whatnot. And then you can see on the lower left here, there are these three beautiful, ornate uh, spigots. And I don't know if each one was for a different drink or for it was, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but isn't that lovely? And it's just so indicative of how, you know, Parisian life and French life was always about injecting an extra bit of uh, artistry into everyday life. I came across, not easy to find by the way, but I came across a, an image here, an engraving of one of these gentlemen in the uh, 1700s, I think, uh, here looking at the clothing. And you can see that they would walk around. I'll zoom in a little bit here. And these sellers of cocoa, is the name of the drink, they were um, very popular men. And they would go around and, they, of course, they would sell their, their, their cold glasses of cocoa. And you can see he's holding a cup and the, the little girl's drinking from a cup. And those are cups strapped to his, 
sort of backpack straps, for lack of a better term. And of course, there were no disposable cups back then. So what you had to do was you'd go and you'd buy the drink from the gentleman, from the vendor, and you'd have to stand right next to him while you finished it. And then you'd give him back the cup and he would rinse the cups in between clients, at least hopefully. So that's what's going on there. And apparently some of the more generous uh, cocoa vendors would also um, just give a, a free drink to some of the kids who couldn't afford it or they didn't have money and whatnot. And that went on all the way through the early 1900s. And then it just kind of vanished. As you can imagine, the, the ice cream vendors came in with their carts and the flavored ices and things like that. And so it kind of put these guys out of business. But that was, uh, you can find that again in the permanent collection of the museum. Hopefully you found that a little bit interesting. Um, I propose, by the way, that we bring back this idea because imagine you're at the Luxembourg Gardens and uh, you're just sitting, you're chilling out, watching the world go by, sitting on one of those classic green chairs. And imagine if some guy walks up with a huge, a huge fountain that's spitting out like red wine or hot chocolate or cafe creme. And he's just like, he comes to you. I think that would be fantastic. And so, I don't know, maybe that'll be a, a business venture of mine. Let me know what you think in the comments because I think that would be pretty stellar. And then lastly, folks, if you've stuck around this long, uh, I, will, I will reward you with this. This is the Bateau Lavrois, not far from the Montmartre Museum. I know many of you know this area and this square. It's part of my walking tour that I give. But you can never get inside. And this is, in a nutshell, former studios uh, of artists like Pablo Picasso and Modigliani and Max Jacob. And I got to help my daughter. Hold on one second. Yes, honey. All right, let's see what we can do. Yeah, it doesn't work well, does it? There you go, honey. Um, okay, back to work here. So the former studios here of Picasso and others, and some have been converted into uh, apartments. So with that knowledge, know that we're gonna come back to the museum now. And I came across these beautiful rare images of inside the Bateau Lavoir in some of the studios. This one right here is around the turn of the century. And you can see the, 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 the clothing there. Um, looks like they're having a pretty good time. This is an anonymous photographer right around the year 1900 in one of those Bateau Lavrois studios. And then this next image, I believe, is from around the same time period. Just stunning. Look at that. My goodness. I don't know which artist this was. And then uh, these next images are from the 1960s. There was a, a photographer by the name of Fage, F-A-G-E. And um, so even, I don't think there are any known images of Picasso's studio when he was here in the early 1900s, but this gives us a, a rough idea of what it would have looked like. And I can tell you, it wasn't, it wasn't the high life. A lot of these artists were, it was almost like a squatting situation where there was uh, very little heat, very little hot water, very few toilets, but they, they thrived here. And it was a, an artist's commune in the Bateau Lavoie. But again, these are from the, the 1960s. But this is very, very rare. Like you can't just Google interior of the Bateau Lavoie and, and come across these images. I tried, believe me. So it's, uh, it's quite a rare treat to see any of these interiors. Lisa Choney says, I love that little voice speaking French. Yeah. yeah, it never gets old, Lisa, I'll tell you. It can get a little bit annoying when the timing's not right and you're just like, ah, my kids are driving me crazy, but it's still damn cute. Look at this. Beautiful. Yeah, honey? You want to film? Okay. Just hold on one second, sweetie. I'm almost finished. Oui, j'ai presque fini, chérie. I think the bell is tolling for the end of this uh, episode, but that's okay because we're about, we're about there. Uh, now, this one is fun because this is one of the entrances, one of the front doors of the Bateau Lavoie. And you can see, first of all, on the lower left, very indicative of those older buildings where there was no indoor plumbing. And so you had essentially often one spigot, one fountain of water, icy cold water that everybody in the building had to use. And so it would, could be very likely we could assume uh, with some certainty that Picasso could have used this very um, spigot or this very faucet. But also here, I want to point out that do you see right here, it might be hard to make out if you're, if you're viewing on a small screen, but there's some ironwork, specifically three letters, three calligraphy letters in ironwork above the door. And when I saw that, I said to myself, oh, 
I know where those letters are. And I've always wondered what, what it looks like as you go through that doorway and entering this building. So knowing that those three letters are there, let me show you a photo that I snapped outside of the Bateau Lavoie with the classic Wallace fountain. And you can see once again, that is what we saw in the photo, those three letters. And as a tour guide, as I've come through here so many times with groups and I've pointed out this building and I've told the story and I've always asked myself like, what does it look like behind that door? Uh, I got my answer one day via these photos in the Musée de Montmartre. And that's what it looked like, at least in the 1960s. And people still have studios in this building. Some of them are just outright living in this building. I'm sure it's not as dilapidated nowadays. It probably uh, costs quite a pretty penny, in fact. But uh, yeah, there we go. Some very rare in interiors of this iconic building. And that's it, folks. We're going to end it here, especially um, I'm getting the sense that my daddy duties are going to kick in big time here in a matter of seconds. Thank you so much, Ellen Corradini. She says, this is so interesting, Corey. I'm spending four nights in Montmartre during my visit to Paris in October, and I definitely want to see this museum. Yeah, let me tell you, too, there are plenty of, of beautiful big things here that I didn't mention, um, almost on purpose, because I just wanted to point out the things that maybe you, you might overlook. But uh, these are just some of the rare, rare treasures, but um, there are... There are many others, so I highly recommend that. You can, again, walk through the gardens just for five euros if you wish and visit the Café Renoir and have a, one of the most iconic art historical coffees of your life or glasses of wine. Or you can pay a little bit extra and get access to both the gardens and the various buildings and the studio of Suzanne Valadon, etc., etc. And there you have it. And back to me. So thanks, everybody. Uh, there won't be a cafe chat today. It's going to be too... My Siri's talking to me. Uh, going to be a bit too complicated today, sorry. So no cafe chat, but hopefully we'll do one uh, soon. And hopefully we'll do another uh, episode 105 very soon as well. So I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much. You'll find links in the description if you want to support me on Patreon or reach me via PayPal or uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of that. So I'm just going to check in one more time with my comments. Thanks everybody who decided to um, send some, some support via the Super Chats today. And thanks everybody uh, if you're watching uh, the replay in the distant future because I, um, I appreciate you as well. So I uh, hope you're staying well and sane and um, just keep on keeping on and I will see you for the next episode hopefully very soon. Take care everybody. See you on the next one.